Oh, well guess what everybody? I hadn't really intended for there to be a part two, so to speak, to the mystery speakers video, but it seems there's been a lot of interest in these, and um, so I thought I'd make a part two video, and so that's what I'm doing right now. I have one of these speakers that I just took the back off of, and I thought I would show you what was inside it, just so you could kind of get an idea of the build quality and stuff. Here's the back of the speaker. It's a solid, pretty uh, pretty weighty board, really. Got some decent thickness to it and things like that. Also has a piece of fluff attached to the back of it. Now, with older speakers, you have to be careful because this might be made of something semi-nasty, but this stuff looks pretty inert to me, and it doesn't look like it's migrated too much over the years. What this stuff does, you'll find this oftentimes in fairly decent quality speakers of some types, there are different ways to build speaker enclosures, and one of the things that you can do is you can use fluff, or what they call lagging sometimes, to make an enclosure seem bigger than it really is at the expense of speaker efficiency. Anyway, what's in here? Apparently I was wrong. I really thought that the, uh, that the woofer driver in these had a plain looking pot metal basket, but apparently it doesn't. It has a sort of brassy colored basket, but there's there's no identification mark on it to speak of. Not even an EIA code that I could find, or at least not anything that seemed sensible. So it doesn't have any markings at all on it. And it's not real. It would clearly have to come out from the front of the speaker because these little clips that are holding it on, I suppose if you were persistent you could unscrew them from the back, but it looks like it's really made to be done through the front, through the grill cloth. There's no crossover here. Just a very simple parallel circuit between the uh, woofer and the tweeter up top. The tweeter is the only thing that even gives a remote hint about who might have made this speaker system because right there it says golden voice just as plain as the day. Now when you take the back off of these speakers it changes the dynamics uh, quite considerably. It changes the way they sound totally. They don't even sound remotely the same. So turn up the radio a bit here. loses a lot of its bass response compared to the other one. The other thing that's interesting, the speaker drivers on these seem to have a great deal of directionality. If I lean this thing down so it's facing the floor, it attenuates the output quite a bit, much more so than I'm used to from having blocked off speaker fronts before. So that's that. That's what they look like inside. And for the other thing, I'm surprised nobody asked about this. Either that means you all think I'm nuts or you just didn't care that much. This is a Technics Quartz Synthesizer FM AM Stereo Receiver SA150. This is the newest addition to my collection. And like I said before, there is a method to my madness here because I try to collect models that are different from one another, that have some differentiating feature, and this one definitely has at least two. For example, put the balance control back, it has a horizontal volume control, I'm sorry, horizontal, it has a vertical volume control as opposed to the horizontal one that most of them do. The input selectors are right next to it. That looks like an equalizer, but it's just simple bass, treble, and balance controls. A digital synthesized tuner with uh, seven station memories. I don't know why they didn't just go ahead and throw an eighth one in there. They certainly could have. And then over here, this is kind of a useless but cool item. This thing shows the path which an audio signal would take through the uh, receiver. Shows you the input selector over here. This says phono, tuner, CD, video, and auxiliary. And then that goes in here. You can see electrically they show you how the tape monitor is kind of inserted in between the inputs and the amplifier. There's the tone control. And then of course here we have not left and right, but actually main and remote speakers. And that whole thing lights up. But that's all it does. It doesn't indicate what the thing is actually doing. These don't change color or turn on and off. It would be kind of cool if they did, but I guess nobody ever thought of that back when they were designing this thing to, you know, maybe have the currently selected input turn a color or something and the currently selected speakers I imagine that probably would have driven the price up, so that's probably why they didn't do it. This has a display unlike any of the other receivers I've got. 
Most of them use a pretty common display panel, either a um, vacuum fluorescent display like this one or a backlit LCD panel. This display is much smaller than the others. But what's really interesting is inside. This thing, of course, is uh, powered by another one of those Sanyo STK amplifier modules. Let's see if I can do that without buzzing myself on an AC line connection inside. Oh, that's always a good thing to avoid doing. Anyway, as you can see here, it's got a modestly sized power transformer. has a reasonable set of filter capacitors the three AA battery holder which needs to be cleaned out on this thing. That's another thing that's interestingly different. For some reason the ones with the vacuum fluorescent displays really don't seem to need the batteries to hold their memory for at least 24 hours whereas the backlit display ones they lose their memory almost immediately when they lose power. This receiver came with its little AM loop antenna out back here but uh, that got sent away. That got donated to someone who needs it more than I do. In this case, YouTube user V Westlife wanted it for his SA946. So I sent it to him, and uh, hopefully he's still enjoying it. Anyway, the audio amplifier is an STK4141 Series 2, and it honestly has the most useless heat sink I have ever seen attached to it. A nice, thick, machined steel plate there, but what's up with that? just one fin? Are you kidding me? Well it must have worked better than I'm giving it credit for because it never seems to get excessively hot even when it's playing I don't want to turn it up too high because I'm not interested in smoking any of these modules but I've turned it up to about four or five about halfway and although it seems to be pumping it out pretty good at about 30 watts per channel worth of output power it's not actually ever getting very hot now this cool indicator on the front panel here that shows you where the audio signal is being routed in the amplifier just as kind of an overview is full of little grain of sand light bulbs so I suppose that when those burn out it's going to be a whole lot of fun replacing them but it looks like they might be somewhat replaceable this thing's pretty clean inside I didn't have to do any major cleaning or anything like that you can see there's some vestigial structures back there for probably unused connections or maybe inputs that they thought about putting on this model or something like that. But there you have it, a look inside the mystery speakers and a study of the newest member of my collection of vintage slimline 1980s Technic stereo receivers. Thank you for watching and if you have a comment feel free to leave one below.